Hello, and welcome to Homegrown KC, a podcast dedicated to exploring Kansas City's fascinating history and sharing stories from its rich past. I'm your host, Laura. Join me today as we explore a piece of Kansas City's history. Before we begin, I have something very serious I want to share with you all. Vaccinations. I want to remind everyone that the new COVID vaccines are safe and effective and very necessary if you want to protect yourself, your friends, family, and neighbors from contracting this potentially deadly infection and resume a, quote, normal existence with in-person contact and events without masks and social distancing. Right now, in America at least, it is available for doctors, nurses, those over 65, and those with underlying conditions. I know there are a lot of you out there that have concerns over the safety of this vaccine. Now, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. Scientist is really not my forte. That's why this is a history podcast. But when scientists and doctors speak and they say, hey, we did all this research and all these studies, and here's what we found, I listen. Right now, they're saying the vaccine is safe. It really, really is. But if you're still worried, then please go talk to your doctor. If you don't have a doctor for whatever reason, which I totally get, I mean, especially if you don't have insurance, which I didn't for a really long time. So if you don't have one, it's legit. I get it. But I'm sure you know at least one person who's a nurse. So ask them. Maybe they don't know the answer to your question if it's really specific. But if you're just worried about how the vaccine was created or how it works, they can answer your questions and reassure you that the vaccine is legitimate and safe and effective. So please do your research, get vaccinated as soon as you can, and then we can put this whole nasty business behind us. But even after you receive the vaccine, please do continue to wear your mask. They're saying that you will not be completely immune until about three to four weeks after your second dose, which if you get it on time is about three to four weeks after your first dose. So that's still two-ish months after your first shot before you are fully immune. Um, And that's only for the two shot. I'm not sure what they're saying for the new um, single dose, which is exciting news. Um, But anyways, I foresee a bunch of people being like, oh yeah, of course I have the vaccine. I'm perfectly safe. Therefore, I don't need to wear a mask, but they are liars. So everyone, please continue to wear the vaccine until you are told otherwise by Dr. Fauci or the president or somebody else in power who knows what they're talking about for solidarity with your fellow citizens, if nothing else, please. Thank you. Anyway, I am so excited to dive back into some Kansas City history with y'all. This is a new series titled Treasures of Kansas City, and I've decided to focus on the elements of the logo. So we have the Country Club Plaza, Union Station, the Western Auto Building, and the Nelson Atkins Museum. And in other news, I have decided to start a merch store. Details of that will be at the end of the episode. Today, we are going to explore the history of the Western Auto Building. Everyone in Kansas City knows what the Western Auto sign looks like. It's a major feature of our skyline. It lights up every night. It's really pretty. And it's on a lot of our city merch, merch, like t-shirts and hats and magnets, stuff like that. God, I can't speak today, can I? Sorry. But there's so much cool history associated with this building. I... On my um, initial research, I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to have one big rabbit hole to dive into. No, there are so many things related to this building. Multiple connections to people and places across all America. It's so cool. Yeah, you had no idea what you were getting into when you decided to listen to this episode, but don't worry, it's all fascinating. You will enjoy it. 
So let's start with the architecture of the building and the man who designed it. It's located at 2014 Grand Avenue, if y'all want to stop by and see it up close. It sits on three acres of land with Grand Avenue to the west, 21st Street to the north, and then there's some railways um, to the east and south. But the tracks are curved, so it's um, it makes it sort of triangle-shaped. A lot of the sources I looked at described it as a piece of pie. It's a uh, commercial-style building, which was really popular in the 1900s um, and designed by architect Arthur Tufts. We'll dig into him in just a moment. So a commercial style uh, is generally 5 to 16 stories tall. It's very utilita utilitarian. There we go. Um, so it's kind of plain and simple and cheap to build. And they also have really big windows. It's largely composed of brick and, quote, reinforced concrete with tar and gravel root, end quote. And it's 12 stories tall. That's not including the basement. And it was built by the Swinson Construction Company, uh, they began in 1914 and they finished in 1915. Longtime listeners will hopefully recognize the Swinson name. I believe I name dropped them in part three of the Pendergast saga. They are the same company that built the Jackson County Courthouse in 1933 as a part of Pendergast's 10 year plan. So if you listen to the Pendergast episode, and if not, please go do so. I'm very proud of that, that series. Uh, you'll remember that TJ had just stepped into a power a couple of years before Western Auto w Building was built. Uh, he came into power in 1911. So he may not have had his hand in all of the pies yet, but he might have had his fingers in a few and maybe this one. Don't know. Uh, anyway, back to the construction of the building. The entrance actually lets in on the third floor, which is a little bit different than usual, but that's because there are different elevations um, I mean, it's, it's like on a hillside, right? So one side, the street is higher than the back side where the street's lower. Does that make sense? Quote, considered fireproof, the original construction included a sprinkler system throughout the building and a fireproof stairway, end quote. There are two docks on the back side of the building where the trucks can load and unload shipments, or could back when it was um, not what it currently is, and I'll get to that way later. Um, and inside, there are two passenger elevators and then two freight elevators. Um, I still haven't been inside of the building yet. That's on my to-do list, hopefully someday in the future. Um, so I haven't seen the elevators. I'm pretty sure that they're still there, though, uh, because otherwise I don't imagine that the building would be structurally sound. But, um, you know, I, they may not be in use right now in its uh, current form. Anyway. It cost a total of $425,000 to build in 1915. And if you want more details on the construction and the architecture, I'll put a link on the website, which will give you more detail on that. So Arthur Tuft. Now I looked and I could not find a definitive link to the founder of the Tuft University. Uh, maybe the last name was more common than I think, but I'm kind of leaning towards them being related somehow. Um, then again, the founder died in 1876, uh, which is like just a couple of years before he's born. So maybe they're not related, but uh, it could be you know, cousins or something. Anyways, Arthur was born in Kirkwood, Georgia on June 29th, 1879 to John Frank Arthur Tuft and Anna Robinson Tuft. All right, so I'm calling him Tuft. There's actually an S at the end. But I feel like I'm about to stumble over it if I try to say Tufts. So we're just sticking with single. Please know that's just a personal choice because the words are not working so well today. I scoured the internet for biological, um, biographical information on Arthur. And what I found was really scant. Even though he seems like he was a really big deal for the time. I guess that just goes to show that you never know what records are going to survive and what won't. Now, one of my sources said that Arthur was from Baltimore, and maybe he studied in Baltimore or he worked there a lot at one time, but he was born in Georgia, he lived in Georgia with his family, and he died and was buried in Georgia, so I don't know where they got Baltimore from. He had at least two brothers, Dr. Edgar Tuff, doctor of what? I don't know, and Robert Barry Tuff. His wife's name, um, this is Arthur. His wife's name was Jean Wilcox Tuft, and they had three sons, Arthur Jr., Rutledge, and John. 
Jean was born in Macon, Georgia to John W. Wilcox Sr. and Anna G. Wilcox. She had seven siblings, Emilia, Louise, Arthur, Marie, John Jr., Louise, and Julia. Her father was, quote, a captain on General John Daring's staff in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. Jean's brothers, John Jr. and Lewis, also grew up to have notable careers. John was a rear admiral in the United States Navy, serving in both World War I and in World War II. Louis was an engineer who worked on the construction of the Panama Canal, where he lost a leg in the explosion, end quote. Okay, so here is connection number one, and it leads directly into connections two and three. His house, which is still standing, the Tufts family called it Woodland, but today it's known as Uppergate House, and it sits in the middle of Emory University. Emory University, for those of you who don't know, is a very prestigious college in Atlanta. It is the second oldest private college in the state of Georgia, and they offer a wide range of liberal art bachelor degrees. They also have a huge healthcare system that, honestly, it sounds like it's even larger than KU Med. They have a law school and they have a theology school. Now, the theology school is how I was aware of Emory because I have a friend uh, from undergrad who went to Emory for his PhD in the, at the theology school. Anyways, uh, Arthur's connection to Emory goes even deeper than this, so here are connections two and three. Asa Candler, the founder of the Coca-Cola Company, and philanthropist hired Arthur to design the original buildings for Emory University. And we'll come back to him in a moment. So originally Emory was just a small college located in Oxford, Georgia, but Candler, who was a member of the board on the college, he wanted to expand it. So he gave them millions of dollars, but only if they would move the campus to this land that he owned called Druid Hills in Atlanta. And of course they said, yes, you've given us this money. We'll give you whatever you want. So Candler sold uh, 25 acres of Druid Hills to his buddy Arthur. Arthur, sorry, I'm probably going to end up doing that a, a few more times. Um, and he then hired Arthur. Um, try that again. He sold it to Arthur. Arthur hired another architect, Henry Hornbostel. I think I said that right. Um, to design his new house. So I don't know why he didn't design it himself, but maybe he was just too busy. So multiple sources. Um, also said that this land used to be a farm before Asa acquired it. I think realistically it was probably a plantation, not just a regular farm. Uppergate is described as a, quote, three-story Italianate mansion with pink stucco and a terracotta tile roofing, renowned for beautiful gardens and two opulent gates known as Uppergate and Lower Gate, end quote. I like Italian style. This sounds like a nice house. The house was completed in 1916 or 1917, two different sources, two different dates, and Arthur lived there with his family until 1920 when he contracted the flu and then quickly became uh, pneumonia and he died very suddenly. It was all within like a week. He is buried in Westview Cemetery in Atlanta. Jean was pregnant at the time of his birth and gave, ugh, gave birth to a girl shortly after her husband died. Uh, sadly, their daughter didn't live long either, and she died before she was two. In 1940, she moved out of Woodland, uh, Upper Gate, to a small house across the street. Emory University purchased the house from her, remodeled it a bit, and it became a dorm house until the 1960s. Um, it's still owned by the university, and its changed departmental hands have been renovated several other times since the 1960s. Okay, a little bit more about the house, and then we'll get back on track. Upper Gate is supposedly haunted. The first supposed sighting occurred in 1971. The blog post I read, which I will link you to on the website, said there have been other sightings. Um, or what's it called when you don't see the ghost, but you hear them? So there, there's been like... Um, People reported hearing the voice of this woman, but not seeing her. Um, <clears throat> the author of this blog implied that it may be the ghost of Arthur's mother, who died when he was a child. But correct me if I'm wrong, aren't ghosts supposed to be locational, right? Like, it doesn't make sense to me that she would appear decades later in a house that was built long after her death. 
And if the first sighting was in 71, it couldn't be his wife because she died in 75. So, who knows? Uh, Jean is also buried in Westview. And Emory University has their personal papers and photographs in the Stuart Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library. Had I known about that earlier and not discovered it at the last minute as I was writing out all my notes, I probably would have requested to see those files. So, circling back to the beginning, um, in addition to Emory, Candler hired Arthur to design multiple buildings for his company, Coca-Cola. And that is, in fact, why he designed this building in Kansas City, because this was originally the headquarters for Coca-Cola in Kansas City. In fact, according to one source, Candler personally chose Kansas City to be the regional headquarters for his company because he had visited and he just loved the city so much. So I'm like, well, of course. He designed, uh, Arthur designed several of the headquarters across America, including, quote, New York City, Dallas, Winnipeg, Chicago, Baltimore, and Atlanta, end quote. So what do you want to hear about first? The history of Coca-Cola or Asa Candler? Okay, option C, it is the history of soda, <laughs> bazinga, but for reals, uh, this is what I thought my original rabbit trail would be. I thought it would be the history of Coca-Cola and soda. I had no idea that there was any connection to Emory. That was so cool to discover, and we're still not out of connections. There will be a few more, <laughs> but how could I explain the history of Coke without first explaining the history of soda in general? The history of soda is fascinating. You should check out episode 206 of Sawbones, Medical Soda. So Sawbones is this uh, comedic medical history podcast with... Oh, frack, I'm totally name-blanking for a minute there. Um, It's a husband and wife, and I am seriously name-blanking, but the wife is the doctor, (laughs) and then her husband is a a comedian. Comic? There you go. It's a, he's a comedian. That's the word I'm looking for. He's a comedian. And so she will talk about this, the history of the subject, and he'll make jokes, and it's just really entertaining. Um, spoiler alert. That's getting back on track here. Spoiler alert. Soda was originally created um, to be a medicine, basically. It's not actually medicine. Please don't try to cure yourself by drinking a ton of soda. You'll probably make yourself worse. But uh, I found a few websites that um, gave a a brief history of soda, which I will also link you to. Basically, here's how it goes. Carbonated water is invented in the late 1700s. Uh, It's only a little bit older than America, which sounds kind of on brand. It was called soda water in 1798, and then the first patent for a soda fountain was filed in 1819. Have you ever gone to a bar and you ask for a missed drink and then they pull out that little squirter and add some soda water? Um, That's basically what the first soda fountain was. But they were added to pharmacies in 1840, and here's where the big connection occurs. So pharmacists used to mix their own drugs. Have you ever seen It's a Wonderful Life? Uh, During that flashback of his childhood, it shows the old guy in the back room mixing medicine. That's how it was, right? And so when they added the soda counter, you could go in and just buy carbonated water or lemonade. or You could get like any kind of fruit syrup you wanted added to your carbonated water so that it wouldn't taste like salt. Because soda water by itself is nasty. How do people drink that? Anyways, um, the pharmacist would also mix their medicines in with the soda water because then the soda water would, like, help it taste better and kind of hide some of the other flavors. In 1886, here's where we're moving into Coca-Cola specifically, okay? In 1886, Dr. John S. Pemberton invented Coca-Cola in Atlanta. Ah, so many connections. Atlanta is very proud of their connection to to Coke, as you can imagine. Um, They have a really superb... As a, a reportedly, I have not yet been, it's on my to-do list, a uh, superb Coca-Cola museum. Vicksburg also has a really small Coca-Cola museum, which I have been to. If I can ever find those pictures, I will we'll, uh, share them with y'all. It's super tiny. It's like a, it's like a one-room museum down in Vicksburg. But it was fun, so if you're ever down there, you should check it out. 
Anyways, um, let's talk about Dr. Pemberton. And yes, we're still on this rabbit trail, and we're going to keep following it, so stop complaining. I really could have gotten a lot more detail than I have. Pemberton was a pharmacist. He created the Coca-Cola syrup um, to be mixed with carbonated water from the cola nut in Africa. And he, he teamed up with, I'm assuming the guy's name is Jacob, because he owns a place called Jacob's Pharmacy. So he teams up with Jacob to sell the drink out of Jacob's Pharmacy. I don't know why Pemberton doesn't have his own, but I guess not everybody had to. Sorry, anyways. Um, also, Coke, Coca-Cola. If you're wondering, did it really have cocaine in it? Lots of different people say lots of different things. The company's official answer is very hard no. I'm going to say yes. It was true. They had coke in it. And I'm going to point out once again that this is because soda was medicine, and when cocaine was first invented, nobody knew how dangerous it was, and they just loved it, and they prescribed it for everything. Because <laughs> they were not good doctors. Anyway, Jacob and Pemberton have a great product. Um, in 1888, just before he died, Pemberton who had been selling off bits and pieces of his stock uh, in his company, sold his last remaining chunk of it to Asa, including the formula, uh, all for a little over $2,000. And then after he died, Candler bought up the rest of the stock from everybody else so that he owned all of it. My source said that he began removing the cocaine from the formula in 1905, um, but it might have contained small amounts as late as 1920. And then under his leadership, Coca-Cola quickly became the very most popular soda in the world. Let's talk about Asa. This is um, connection number three, possibly number four. I've lost count at this point. Asa Candler was born in Villa Rica, Georgia on December 30th, 1851. His father was Samuel Charles Candler, and his mother was Martha Burnett Beale Candler. Uh, he was the middle child of 11. There was Milton Anthony, Ezekiel Samuel, Noble Daniel, Julie Florence, Sarah Justina, William Beale, Elizabeth Francis, Samuel Charles, Warren Aiken, and John Slaughter. According to the Georgia Encyclopedia, his father was, quote, a prosperous per merchant and planter, end quote. Now, they could have just said farmer, but they said planter. And as a historian, that tells me he was actually a plantation owner, which means they owned slaves. Ace's wife was Lucy Elizabeth Howard Candler. She was born in Cartersville, Georgia on September 28, 1859. They met in Atlanta, where Asa had moved as a young man and gotten a job at her father's drugstore. Apparently, he wanted to be a doctor when he was a kid, but they didn't have money to send him to college, so he decided to become a pharmacist instead. They had five children together, Charles Howard Candler, Asa Griggs Candler, Lucy Beale Candler Lead, Walter Turner Candler, and William Candler. So, in addition to being a pharmacist, turns out Asa was a crack businessman, just he knew how to run it. After he bought the Coca-Cola formula, he and his brother John, and then Pemberton's former business partner Frank, maybe Frank owned uh, Jacob's Pharmacy, and then two other unnamed men uh, built Coca-Cola into what it is today, and it, it basically went viral from... Uh, 1888 onwards. In four years, the business grew tenfold, according to the Coca-Cola company website, and he sold his pharmaceutical business, uh, that would be Asa, sold his business, in order to focus on his soda business. I didn't see it stated anywhere, but I wonder if he inherited the pharmacy or bought the pharmacy from his father-in-law. Just out of curiosity there. He became a millionaire, uh, as you do when you have a company that's growing as quickly as that. And he invested in real estate and banking. That's how he came to own Druid Hills. 
He also created the Central Bank and Trust Co. in Atlanta um, for all of Coca-Cola's banking needs. <laughs> On the one hand, that seems really smart and uh, savvy, right? That I own the bank where my company banks. But on the other, it kind of seems like a huge conflict of interest and a little bit shady. His buddy, Arthur, I kind of would like to know how these two men met. Didn't see that anywhere. Um, he designed the Candler Building in Atlanta for him, and it was the tallest building in Atlanta when it was completed in 1906. And then Asa also had several other philanthropic ventures that he was a part of. In 1916, he was elected mayor of Atlanta. According to the Georgia Encyclopedia, he had already handed over control of Coca-Cola to his kids by then, but he still owned the bank, so really he kind of still owned Coca-Cola, right? Um, but apparently he was really effective as a mayor, and he helped straighten out the city's finances, so let's go, go him. And apparently he was single-handedly responsible for the military's decision to establish Camp Gordon in Atlanta after the U.S. joined World War I. Um, it was a training facility, and they only picked Atlanta because he promised to pay for the plumbing. His wife, Lucy, died in 1919, and in 22, he remarried May Little Reagan. R Reagan? Reagan? R-A-G-I-N. But they were super, super unhappy. So in 23, just a year later, he tried to divorce her. But it, it never went through. Or he changed his mind and they just stayed separated. He suffered a stroke in 26 and he remained ill until his death in 1929. All right. You will all be happy to hear that we're leaving Atlanta and returning to Kansas City. We're going to resume discussion on the Western Auto Building for now. <laughs> so it was first the Coca-Cola Building, and they even had a big sign on the roof that said Coca-Cola. It stayed up there until 1928. There were spaces, office spaces within the building that Coca-Cola wasn't using, so they rented those out to the H.R. Enos Real Estate in Investment Company. In 1919, the Candler family, Ace's children, sold the company to Ernest Woodruff, who was another Atlanta businessman and banker. The KC headquarters stayed in the building until 1932, even though they sold the building in 1922. I Guess the company just rented space for the next 10 years. Doesn't seem like a smart decision, but whatever. In 22, the Candler family had bought the building for themselves, and so then it was called the Candler Building. And they maintained ownership until 1947 when they sold it to... Guess. Take a wild guess. You'll never get it. Okay, you're all brilliant and you guessed correctly. But yes, the Candler building, uh, Candler family, sold the building to Emory. And in 1950, Emory sold the building to an investor from New York, Mr. Jerome Riker. And then he sold it to Western Auto within a year. So now it's 1951, and we finally have the Western Auto building. Whew. A lot of my sources refer to it as the Coca-Cola building because that was its first name. I think Kansas Cityans of today know the building as the Western Auto Building because of the Western Auto sign, right? But I've been wondering throughout my research if there's anyone who knew it originally as the Coca-Cola Building or even as the Candler Building. I think it would be kind of like Sandstone or Kemp Arena, right? That's not what their official names are anymore, but that's what they were known as for decades. It's what I knew them as as a child and what I still call them. But I chose to call this the Western Auto Building because of the Western Auto sign. And that's what's on my logo, and that's what it's largely known as. This is the end of today's episode. Come back in a couple of weeks to learn about the Western Auto Company and the history of the Western Auto Building since the 1950s. Before we sign off, let's talk sources. 
None of this came from a book. There are no books about the Western Auto Building. It all came from online sources. A lot of them. We have findagrave.com for biographical information, as always. Um, kchistory.org and pendergaskc.org. Both have pages dedicated to the history of this building, of course. Uh, there's also the official Coca-Cola website and the websites dedicated to the history of soda, as I mentioned. The Emory University website has a few web pages dedicated to their founder, um, Asa, and to Upper Gate House. And then there's that blog that I mentioned. It's called the Regorgian Revival, and it's written by Revival Construction Co., which is a historical preservation renovation company based in Atlanta. I'll have links to some of these pages on my website. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, exciting news, I've decided it's time for Homegrown KC to have some swag. So I'm going to start small with buttons, magnets, keychains, and coffee mugs. I don't have the merch store created yet. Uh, I hope to soon, so keep an eye out on all the social media pages for that announcement. Make sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Twitter. I am Homegrown KC on all of those. You can also visit my website for additional information. That's homegrownkc.wordpress.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or episode suggestions, you can email me at homegrownkcpodcast at gmail.com. If you don't remember what that is, I have it listed on my Facebook page and on my website. I know that money's tight right now, especially as we are in the midst of a pandemic and millions of Americans are still unemployed. But if you want to support the show, you can do so by subscribing to patreon.com slash homegrownkc or redcircle.com slash homegrownkc. Here's how it works. You sign up, create an account, subscribe to the show. You'll be charged that day and then on the first of every month. It's only $5. Everything that you give goes back into the show. If you become a supporter, you get a number of goodies. Number one, you get access to exclusive interviews. Number two, you get a shout out here on the show. So thank you, Bjorn and Linda, for your support. And number three, you will get one free item from the merch store valued at $5 or under. So Bjorn and Linda, I will be contacting you about that soon. Or if you can't commit to a monthly donation and you just want to give a one-time donation, that feature is now available at redcircle.com slash homegrownkc. Thank you goes out to my very talented sister-in-law, Sarah McCombs, for the creation of my logo. To the Dear Misses for the use of their song Kansas City as the intro and outro music of the show. And to local libraries, which enabled me to gather all of my research, especially... Matt from the Missouri Valley Research Center at the Kansas City Public Library. You were a lifesaver. Thank you. Thanks for listening. seem to shake this feeling and I can seem to get you off my mind